was when I ruled the world. So I am, I am an entrepreneur, and I am an investor, and I'm a teacher and a mentor. Um, I'm here uh, mostly because I'm a teacher and a mentor. I am extremely passionate about helping great entrepreneurs achieve great things. And I like to believe that I have an appreciation for the differences that entrepreneurs face in different areas of the world. And what I'd like to do is try to help them maximize the outcomes for them here in, uh, whether it's here in Northern Italy or throughout Europe uh, or other places around the world, I try to make sure that entrepreneurs able, are able to establish that type of Silicon Valley experience that they think they would have if they lived in Silicon Valley, that actually they probably wouldn't have, um, but that they're able to create the best Silicon Valley for themselves wherever they are as entrepreneurs. As an entrepreneur, um, I have been um, in leadership roles in four startups in, in the United States, all, all companies that are based in San Francisco. I um, uh, most recently have been the chief financial officer for my previous two entre uh, entrepreneurial pursuits, both of which were sold to strategic buyers. Uh, and it was um, a big data genomics company that uh, took all of the um, all of the genetic information, uh, DNA um, mutation expression data, uh, cross-referenced with all of the patients that have been involved in public and, and private uh, studies, and matches that together to allow you to say, if this patient presents with a certain form of cancer, and they have this gene mutation or this gene expression, they would tend to do better with this therapy instead of this therapy. Yes, yeah, so I was, I was taken with uh, David Roberts' uh, graph uh, early in the, uh, the, the day today, where he not only showed how the, the, the cost of getting the DNA information is coming down dramatically, but all of the other things you can then do with that DNA information is coming down dramatically. And I think this uh, uh, next bio is a great example of that. So once the cost of getting the genetic information for a patient comes way down, then you can use that as part of the diagnosis of a patient or the prognosis of a patient or to influence the course of therapy. If it costs $30,000 to get the genetic makeup of a patient, you're not gonna do that to change whether you take this $1,000 therapy or this $1,000 therapy. If it costs $99 to get that information, you're gonna do that because it's cheaper than an MRI. Um, it's, uh, maybe even cheaper than an x-ray, right? So that's information that you will just naturally acquire as part of the determination of what a physician is going to do. Even better, you can have the difference between an efficacious drug and a real problem drug if you say, well, if the patient has this, these symptoms, um, maybe there is some chance of morbidity um, by taking a drug. But if the patient has these symptoms and has this gene mutation, then there's no morbidity. So now you can prescribe a therapy, a course of therapy, that has dramatically improved outcomes for patients. So it's a wonderful arena, and it's just a great validation of, what Dave, of one of David Roberts' many uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, um, uh, vectors that he talked about this morning. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, just personally, I like working with companies that are doing something really important and really dramatic, and um, I've got a couple of other very exciting companies we can discuss uh, if time permits. Um, uh, and one in particular that I'm both an investor in and I'm also acting as their CFO is a, an electric truck and bus control system company. This is a company that has designed, uh, they make the circuit boards and the software that allow any truck or bus to become an electric truck or bus. What they do is you can use whatever batteries you want, whatever motor you want, whatever chassis you want, whatever body you want, and instead of having a diesel or gasoline powertrain, you have batteries and a motor. And they, what they've designed is this flexible control system that allows the scalability 
of that entire process. So they are right now delivering their first garbage truck, their first two school buses, and their first shuttle bus, and it's all using the same control technology. The company is called Motive Power Systems, and it's an incredibly exciting moment for the company as well. And what's wonderful is they, all they do is the circuit boards and the software, and they allow all the companies that currently build gasoline vehicles or diesel vehicles now to build electric vehicles. And so they don't have to build new factories. They don't have to build new manufacturing lines. They use the existing manufacturing lines. They don't have to build a completely new bus. They use the same bus. It's not a new body, it's the same body. So everybody that builds bodies still builds bodies, and everybody that assembles vehicles still assembles vehicles. And it's a, it's a wonderful way, it's perfect for the truck and bus market. It's an ext extremely exciting moment because there are no electric garbage trucks. They could not exist without this technology. And the first one is being delivered to the city of Chicago in December. And it will be riding around quietly collecting garbage uh, early in the morning uh, somewhere, in the, somewhere in the city of Chicago and then hopefully um, other places throughout the world. They only needed $3 million to this point in four years to design and develop the technology as it is. Um, and they've also been successful and they've gotten 2.5 million of that in grant money. So they've raised only $500,000 of actual equity capital, $2.5 million of grant money, and now they of course need some, some scale up money. But they already now have a product, a working product, customers, orders, uh, receivables, and now they've gotten themselves to a place where they're able to be uh, venture capital funded. I think that wherever you are as an entrepreneur or, or whether you're being an incubator or whether you're trying to establish out licensing or you're trying to foster entrepreneurship in whatever region of Italy or whatever uh, area of the world you're in, I believe that you need to understand your assets and try to leverage those assets as much as possible. Don't try to become Silicon Valley or don't try to become Boston or don't try to become London. Um, and uh, in the case of, uh, for example, let's, you know, Northern Italy, where there are a number of governmental initiatives trying to help foster, whether it's uh, changing regulations or establishing incubators or, or, or helping fund incubators in certain ways, um, I think those are all fabulous. And what I think those, those things should focus on, though, number one is there's a tremendous amount of technology inherent and embedded in companies and even more so in universities throughout Italy. Um, I think that the, the emphasis should be on trying to e exploit or take advantage of those technologies and be able to provide a forum for people to take those technologies and apply them to a real market, whether it's the European, Ital Ital Italian market, the European market, the global market. Um, in second, I think that governments probably shouldn't put money directly into businesses Rather, they should entrust other people to make those decisions, like venture capital-like people or crowdsourcing people or folks that, have, um, that are in the business of choosing which companies they should invest in. The beautiful example, perfect example would be if someone is raising a fund to pursue investment in companies, if a government matched that dollar for dollar, which I think has happened in, in a, at least a couple of instances in Italy, that, and I know it's happened throughout Europe in a few areas, that's the perfect model. It's effectively subsidizing the returns of that fund in a way that allows that fund to still operate on an autonomous basis and source deals the way they would ordinarily source deals and maximize that outcome.